Hi, Happy New Year. I'm Annie. Today I'm going to talk about cravings. A lot of people in the new year are eliminating certain things from their diets, maybe sugar, alcohol, processed foods, and they're dealing with cravings. I've had a lot of experience experimenting with different diets over the years, and so I'm really familiar with the process of eliminating things and feeling cravings. So I'd just like to share my observations with you. If you'd like to talk to me about habits or cravings or anything within reason, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one video chat session with me. Just check out my snug link in the description. Many people are focusing on eliminating bad dietary choices in the new year. Personally, I'm cutting out sugar and alcohol and I'm aiming for a low-carb diet because I know from experience that it works the best for me. A low carb diet isn't the best for everyone. I've seen it work for some people, not for others. You got to do your research and your experimentation to see what works for you. The only reason that I gave up my ketogenic diet back in uh, last spring was because of the pandemic, because there was so much uncertainty and my partner had stocked up on a lot of kind of cheaper staples, you know, and that would include rice and beans. He sort of requested that I be more flexible and, you know, maybe be open to eating some cheaper foods since we had so much of it around and I thought that made sense just because things were so uncertain. Things are still extremely uncertain. I mean, it's January 7th, so the Capitol building was just uh, sieged yesterday. So things are still crazy, but it's kind of the new normal and I really just miss my ketogenic diet, so I'm ready to go back to it. And I've experimented with other diets in the past. Uh, one time, a low-fat, raw vegan diets where salt was completely el eliminated. Uh, now on a low carb diet, I do eat salt because it's important to get enough salt and minerals when you are uh, restricting carbohydrates. But for one reason or another, people's doctors ask them to eliminate salt sometimes, maybe if they have hypertension or uh, kidney issues. And I know it can be very shocking to somebody if you've always added salt to your food to suddenly eliminate it and just um, experience this blandness, you know, everything tastes really bland without salt if you're not used to it. So I've done a lot of experimenting. I've been through the process of eliminating different things over the years and being disciplined in my dietary choices. So I want to talk a little bit about those observations. So one thing that I've noticed, if you're eliminating sugar, even salt, even alcohol, maybe alcohol's trickier, you just have to get over the hump. So for example, when you cut out sugar, it can be quite shocking and you can also experience experience detox symptoms that can make you feel pretty shitty. The food might taste really boring. You might really crave sugar. But if you get over the hump, if you're just patient and you stick with it, your taste buds adjust. Sweetness and saltiness is really on a continuum. And so if you completely eliminate sugar, you will notice over time that things taste sweet that you never noticed before were sweet. You might find yourself saying something like, wow, this broccoli is so sweet. Even something like broccoli has sugar in it that you just can't detect because you're so used to eating sugar in this super concentrated form. You're eating too much sugar, so your taste buds are desensitized to it. But when you eliminate it, your taste buds get really sharp. Natural whole foods that are just available from the earth start to taste really exciting. They don't taste boring anymore. The same thing is true for salt. If you cut out salt, it is shocking at first, but after a little while, you will start to notice, and it doesn't even take very long, really. I don't know, for me, just a, a matter of a few days after eliminating sugar or salt. You eliminate salt, and then you will notice, wow, a tomato is so salty. It, it has a significant amount of salt in it, and your taste buds become very sensitive to it. Zucchini also is salty, and you wouldn't think that unless you completely eliminated salt and then, you know, ate zucchini, you would start to notice that it's actually salty and satisfying. But most people don't ever get over the hump. They cave into those cravings way too soon. They are eliminating sugar. They feel kind of crappy. They have some detox. And so, you know, they just eat some sugar to make all the bad feelings go away. But if you actually sit with it and stay with it, it doesn't even really take that long to get over that hump. So if you just exercise a little bit of self-control, you can get there. So right now I'm allowing myself to get into ketosis and that can be kind of uncomfortable. I've done this before. I sort of know what I'm doing. 
doing and my body recognizes that state because I pretty frequently practice intermittent fasting. So a lot of times, you know, in the morning when I'm going throughout my day, I'm in ketosis anyway. My body recognizes the state and it uses ketones efficiently. So it's not like a huge shock to my system the way that it would be for someone who's coming off of like highly processed, really high sugar, high carb diet, you know, going straight into ketosis. It can make you feel really bad. You know, like you, you're just down and out. You're like, you would need to take the week off if you were going to do something that extreme. For me, I sort of know the parameters of my body and how it uses fuel. And so I'm just kind of forcing myself into it because I feel like the quicker I get into ketosis, then the easier it'll be. I don't want to prolong that process. I just want to switch over. So on January 1st, of course, I had to eat some black eyed peas, you know, for good luck. Not that it's helping. I don't know. How much worse off would we be if I didn't eat black eyed peas? I, I don't know. Maybe not enough people ate black eyed peas. Maybe uh, that's why we're kind of having a bumpy start to the new year. I don't know. I'm not really that superstitious, but I do always eat black eyed peas. I probably had like an eighth of a cup of them or something. It only took me, I think, by January 3rd when I was in ketosis. For a couple days there, it was kind of bumpy. I felt kind of um, brain dead, uh, kind of lethargic, and I knew that that was normal. So I was okay with it, just sitting with it and feeling that way. I knew that it would pass and it did. So it took me until January 3rd. That's really fast. For some other people, it could take them like five to seven days to actually get into ketosis. But again, I know how my body works and that's pretty normal for me. So craving really is on a continuum. Eating super concentrated forms of food, sugar, salt, or processed foods, those are really exciting substances to your taste buds. They're sort of like unnatural naturally exciting. And so yeah, you're going to feel a little dull and bland when you take them away. But you really can adjust so quickly if you just give it a chance and hardly anyone ever has the patience to just wait it out. They just feel too uncomfortable. Now part of that can be that there are also psychological addictions to those substances. You have to ask yourself, why are you eating the sugar? Why are you eating a snack if you're not hungry? Are you bored? Is exciting food the only exciting thing in your life? Is that the problem? Or are you overeating or drinking in order to avoid emotions? Uh, for me, it's not really any crazy hidden emotions. I sometimes stop and get a snack because of uncertainty. So 2020 was kind of a trigger for me, just feeling like uncertain about what's going to happen next. What is my work situation going to look like? Also, when I'm working on creative projects, if I get stuck and I don't know how to proceed, then I just feel paralyzed and I feel like I better take a break. And when I take a break, I eat a snack. But because I know that about myself, I can just observe it and choose differently. I've observed myself long enough to know that that's my tendency. I know that that's what's going on. I'm stuck in a creative process. I don't know how to proceed. I'm too afraid to make a choice or make a decision or take any action. So I feel paralyzed. I know this is my pattern because I've observed it over and over again. And so I don't need to freak out about it because I know this is a natural process for me. So I don't need to, you know, spiral into a bunch of nervous eating. I could just sort of step out of myself, observe it, and choose differently. And there are really good alternatives like, you know, going for a walk is really great for my creative problem solving or taking a shower, anything to just get me to relax a little bit so I can let my creative problem solving explore possibilities in a really relaxed manner and then, you know, reapproach the project later. It is not necessary to stop and eat an ice cream sundae. I just simply remind myself that I'm a grown up and I can override these cravings and make grown up decisions. And if you do this even once or twice, stand up to your own craving it's pretty empowering. You realize that you are the adult in the room. You don't need to let this impulsive child drive the bus. You're the boss. You drive the bus. Be the adults. Make the decisions. So for a couple days there when I was feeling really brain dead because of, you know, not quite being in ketosis yet and feeling just kind of fatigued and crashy. Uh, my partner was kind of teasing me and he said, come on, just have some M&Ms. You know you want them. 
I didn't appreciate that too much. You know, that's kind of rude. But we rib each other all the time, so I didn't really take it personally either. And also, I was really solid on my decision. I knew what I was doing, so I didn't feel tempted at all. Like, I was not going to eat some carbohydrates or sugar just to take the edge off in that moment, because then it would take me that much longer to get into ketosis. It would just prolong the process. It's the same thing if you're eliminating salt. I mean, you can decrease it gradually, but at some point you just have to go for it and eliminate it. And if you do this back and forth flip flop, like, oh, I'm not eating salt. Oh, never mind. Let me have this big pile of French fries that are overly salted. And you keep being inconsistent with yourself, then it just prolongs the pain. When really, if you just eliminate the salt, your taste buds adjust and you don't miss it. You just adjust to the new reality. You want to be consistent with yourself the way that you would be consistent with a child or a dog. If you send mixed signals to yourself saying like, don't have any sugar, oh, never mind, binge on a birthday cake and a whole bunch of candy, you know, you, it's just going to really prolong the misery. So you feel deprived, you feel like you want to just give in to, you know, your FI or whatever that wants the shiny thing, wants the sugar. So, so you're taking the short-term pleasure in that moment, eliminating the pain, taking the pleasure, but you are prolonging the long-term pain. You know, if you're just consistent with yourself and focused, you just switch over. You have new habits. You have a new reality where things are relatively sweet and salty, just on a different spectrum of the continuum. Not eating salt is the new normal. Not even eating sugar is the new normal. And it's not even that hard if you just give it a few days. Except for maybe social pressures, I guess. I always forget about that because I'm not social. So I apologize. I know that a lot of other people are extremely social. And so it could be difficult if you were, you know, trying to not eat sugar and you found yourself at a birthday party and maybe, you know, there's smells and even like social pressure to partake in some of those things. And people might um, think that you're stuffy or a stick in the mud or just being too strict and boring if you try to say like I'm not gonna eat sugar that's kind of what my partner does with me he, he sort of makes fun of me for you know what he considers to be an extreme diet you know in thinking of this the things that we fight about that has been one of them because we're so different I'm five feet tall and my metabolism is pretty low my resting heart rate is extremely low so I'm just not burning very many calories or he's like six three he has like a fast heart rate a high metabolism and so he'll stay stuck like, you know, you can eat anything you want. You just have to eat less. I don't want a quarter of a hamburger. I want a big giant salad. Like it'll just feel like a rip off to me if I eat three bites of a hamburger and that's all I get. It's just easier for me to not do that at all. Anyway, that's one of the things that we have fought about. He's like, I don't get it. I don't understand you. Like, why don't you just eat less? It's like, because if I'm eating regular, like big people food, I get to have about like this much and it just feels like a rip off. That's why I eat these big salads that he makes fun of me for. It's because I want to sit down and eat a big plate of food like a normal person. <laughs> and so I just make sure that the, the foods are, you know, lower calorie, high nutrition foods. Obviously, alcohol is a trickier thing. I know that, you know, a lot of people have problems with that and they actually need some help. They need assistance to, to eliminate alcohol. Or maybe they have actual, you know, physical withdrawal symptoms. Another thing that can happen, even if you don't have like overt physical withdrawal symptoms, you can have mood issues. So if you just sort of drink regularly and then you stop completely, you could be more susceptible to depression. Uh, there are some different supplements that can help with that. It's also really important to get a lot of healthy fats in your diet. Uh, I'm not going to get into those supplements or, you know, what is happening physiologically with the way that your body metabolizes uh, fat because of alcohol. Uh, but you can look that up. It's interesting. For me, I don't really have any kind of dependency. Like if I stop drinking it, it's not like the addiction, it's like the habit, I guess. I make a distinction there. It's not like a physical addiction. It's just like the time of day and the ritual and the relaxation. So no physical withdrawal symptoms. And uh, I mean, that kind of shocks me because for myself, 
size, I can kind of drink a lot. <laughs> I have kind of a high tolerance, so it just surprises me. Like, when I just stop drinking it, it's like nothing. Like, I almost kind of forget. It's just, like, I drink because it's fun and it's relaxing. But when I think about my liver having to process it, that's really what motivates me to not want to drink it. I just, I don't want to do that to my liver, at least not on a super regular basis. I think it's uh, fine if it's, like, a special occasion thing. Also, it just makes it easier to lose weight if you eliminate alcohol. But if there's some emotional reason why you're drinking, like if you're drinking to avoid something or to cover up pain or and you're drinking to manage that, I, I can see how you would maybe need help with something like that. So I guess I'm just saying this because I don't want to make it sound like it's just super easy to stop drinking because I know that it isn't for a lot of people. So anyway, those are my thoughts on cravings. Um, feel free to chime in if you have anything to add. I hope everyone's having a wonderful new year. I'll talk to you soon.